Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Cannell from Carnegie Mellon, and I'm here to talk about how changing technology trends in reconfigurable data center networks have posed a problem for TCP. This is work that was done at Carnegie Mellon and UC San Diego, but primarily by Matt Mukherjee, who could not be here today. What exactly do I mean by reconfigurable data center network? If you take a traditional multi-level uh, CLO or factory topology that provides all-to-all -all connectivity, and you combine it with a higher bandwidth circuit network that provides temporary reconfigurable bandwidth between certain racks. And this temporary bandwidth can sometimes be 8 or 10x as high. The underlying technologies that implement this circuit network could be 60 gigahertz wireless or optical circuit switching or free space optics, but the trends in this talk apply to all of these technologies. Let's look at what the available bandwidth looks like from a rack point of view over time. So we have, we'll plot in a cartoon available bandwidth over time. Each rack has a top of rack switch which can connect to either the packet network or the circuit network in this particular model that we're operating in. When the uh, packet network is in use, the bandwidth is relatively low. When the network scheduler decides that a circuit will be allocated between these two racks, their, relative, uh, or their available bandwidth increases to be 8 or 10x higher, and then shortly drops again once the circuit is torn down. Some other uh, designs of this type of network have considered connecting the top of rack switch to both networks simultaneously or only using a circuit network. But in this case, we're not considering those types of proposals. And we assume that the reconfigurable data center network is a black box. And we don't do any kind of flow segregation between the two networks. All flows will go over either the packet network or the circuit network. Now, 10 years ago, uh, when this research really kicked off, um, papers were able to prove that reconfigurable data center networks were able to really speed up data center workloads. This is a figure that I copy and pasted from the see-through paper in SIGCOM 2010. And compared to this blue line, which is just the packet network, a hybrid network is able to achieve much lower flow completion times on this CDF graph. This was really wonderful in 2010, but over the last decade, Engineers and researchers have made a lot of advances in the underlying circuit switch technology and how these networks are put together. And this, these advances have led to a 10x reduction in the reconfiguration delay, during, uh, which is how long it takes one of these networks to reconfigure. And what this means is that all of a sudden, these networks can reconfigure much more frequently. So instead of having your available bandwidth look like something like this, where a circuit might be up for 10 milliseconds, Today, the network looks more like this. You get more but shorter circuits between any two racks. This is better for a couple of reasons. Um, it's more flexible in that this finer grain multiplexing will support more dynamic workloads. And this is better for hosts because it takes a lot of data to saturate a, a high bandwidth circuit for 10 milliseconds. And, um, so having shorter circuits means the hosts have to do less batching and, and pre-buffering themselves. However, this new trend in circuit technologies has posed a problem for TCP. We ran an experiment on an emulator that we built that sends 16 flows, long-lived flows, from one rack to another rack. And in this experiment, our packet network was 10 gigabits per second, and the circuit network was 80 gigabits per second. We looked at average circuit utilization for a whole bunch of TCP variants. And what we saw was actually that none of the TCP variants were able to achieve more than about 55% circuit utilization. Now, this is a bit um, puzzling, because if we had just deployed this expensive and fancy network, we would like TCP to be able to actually take advantage of this bandwidth. But unfortunately, no variant was able to make use of this new bandwidth that we had just deployed. To understand what's going on, let's look a little bit closer at TCP's behavior during a circuit. This is a plot uh, over time of the TCP expected sequence number. The gray region in the middle is when a circuit is active. And in this experiment, the circuit was up for 180 microseconds. So during this period, the racks of, of which these flows are traversing can communicate with higher bandwidth for 180 microseconds. And 
The other times, the packet network is in use. The first line I'm going to show you is the theoretical optimal capacity of the network. This is if you're absolutely utilizing um, every last bit per second. The achieved bandwidth, since this is a plot of expected TCP sequence number, is just the slope of this line. And in this case, 1x versus 8x. I'm also going to show you another baseline, which is if we were just using the packet network. And so this is any improvement above the orange line is the benefit of having a reconfigurable data center network. If we send a TCP cubic flow over this test bed, what we would like to see is something that looks like this, TCP getting basically full utilization. But in reality, what happens is this. And the reason for this is because this 180 microseconds is only a handful of RTTs. And a handful of RTTs is not enough time for TCP to increase its sending rate by 8x. But what, what is the underlying problem here? Uh, all TCP variants have been designed in some way to adapt to changing network conditions, whether that be congestion or bottleneck links or changes in RTT due to queuing. But the bandwidth fluctuations in this reconfigurable data center network design are an order of magnitude more frequent and more substantial than TCP variants have been designed to handle up until now. And this breaks an implicit assumption in the stability of the network. Therefore, we need an order of magnitude shift in how fast TCP reacts when it run on this type of network. The rest of this talk is going to be about our two-part solution to this problem. We're going to propose two techniques, the first in the network, that, where we're going to use information about upcoming circuits to transparently trick TCP into ramping up. This is going to give us our high utilization that we're looking for, but it's going to cost us in tail latency. So in order to mitigate that tail latency, we're going to propose a second technique by involving the end hosts and proposing a new TCP variant, Reconfigurable Data Center Network, TCP, RETCP. We'll explicitly react to circuit state changes and uh, get rid of that tail latency penalty. These two techniques can be deployed separately, but they work best together. One gives high utilization, and one gives good latency. Let me start with our first technique. Now, if you look at this available bandwidth graph over time for just one of these circuit periods, what would we really like TCP to do? Ideally, we would have TCP's congestion window kind of parallel in shape this um, bandwidth line. So if we look at a cartoon of congestion window over time, we'd like to see something that looks kind of like this. But how do we get this to manifest in our network? The first step towards this that we can take is let's just make the congestion window bigger all the time. Uh, and we know how to do this for networking researchers. The easiest way to do this is just to increase the size of our network buffers. The capacity of the network goes up, and we can um, increase our congestion window so that more data is outstanding when the circuit comes up. This would create a uh, line on the congestion window graph that's flat at the our high target. But as we all know, that if you increase the size of your network buffers, you're going to be hit with a penalty in latency. Uh, let's just visualize um, exactly what this looks like in a reconfigurable data center network setting before we go any further. If we have a sender and a receiver that are communicating over a low bandwidth delay product packet network and a high bandwidth delay product circuit network, in between the sender and the receiver and their respective ends of the network are top of rack switches that have queues. And let's say that packets are flowing like this over the circuit network. If we increase the top of rack switch queues, this is going to build up more packets in advance of a circuit and lead to higher utilization. That's good for bandwidth. However, when we switch back to the, using the packet network, we're going to have all these extra packets in our queues. And this is going to really hurt our latency. So just to demonstrate that this does, in fact, work, we looked at uh, a graph of average circuit utilization for a bunch of different static size of the uh, Tor VOQs. And as you would expect, we did get higher utilization. But of course, as you would also expect, the downside to this is an increase in latency. So we're looking at, on the x-axis, our uh, average circuit utilization. And the y-axis is the corresponding latency required to get that utilization. And as you can see, for both median latency and 99th percentile latency, um, the latency increases quite substantially. So naturally, our next question is, how can we improve this latency? The um, 
easiest thing to think about would be, well, we're using large buffers for a really long part of the time. Like, we're going to have a, a huge sea wind for the entire uh, duration of the experiment. Well, why don't we use large buffers only when a circuit is active? And so we propose a new technique. And this is the crux of our first technique, which is dynamic buffer resizing. Some amount of time before a circuit becomes active, we will transparently resize in the network our top of rack switch queues from being a small size to being a large size. And this will give us a congestion window graph that looks kind of like this. Some amount of time in advance of the circuit, our Tor buffers will increase. TCP will have space to grow its congestion window. And uh, eventually, we will reach uh, full utilization. This will give us our full utilization, similar to using a um, static queue the entire time. But it will only have latency degradation during the small period of time in advance of a circuit when we're actually using these big queues. Returning to our visualization from before, let's look at congestion window over time when the circuit's going to appear at this dotted line. This red arrow is going to track where we are in time. When the packet network is in use, the um, congestion window will be small. At some point in time, we'll decide ahead of a circuit that a circuit is inbound, and we will increase our Tor buffers. This will allow the congestion window to slowly ramp up. And then when we use the when we switch to using the circuit network, we'll have our desired high utilization before switching back to the packet network and uh, dropping back down. However, there are a couple of parameters that I've kind of swept under the rug here. And the first is, how long in advance do we actually resize these Tor queues dynamically? The answer to this is, we want TCP to have enough time to grow its congestion window to the bandwidth delay product of the circuit network. And this is dependent on uh, the TCP variant that you're using and the round trip time. Uh, and I'll give some numbers for our test bed in a minute. There's also the question of how big do you need to allocate these top of rack switch buffers on your switch? And this is, should just be a conservative upper bound of the circuit bandwidth delay product, with, which in our experiments with a 80 gigabits per second circuit network that had a one-way delay of 40 microseconds, this was 45-ish 9,000 byte packets. And for the evaluation that I'm going to show, we were able to achieve 90% utilization um, with Tor buffers that were holding about 40 packets. Um, in our experiment, we gave a little bit of leeway, and we, let, we actually resized the Tors to 50 packets just to make sure that we were able to fully achieve our, the utilization we wanted. Let's go back in depth at the expected sequence number over time. This graph is on a slightly different scale, and our circuit is still 180 microseconds. But we're going to add a second y-axis, which is the occupancy of the top of rack switch queues at any given time. Let me put our two baselines back up, optimal and packet only, so all our lines should fall in between there. And again, the bandwidth that we achieve is the slope of these lines. For no amount, no pre-buffering, say resizing the queues uh, zero microseconds in advance. Um, this is like a, just a baseline where the technique is not being applied. We can see that in this dotted line, the, which is the top of rack switch buffer size, is steady at a low value. The utilization, which is the solid line on the left y-axis, is getting about 50%, 49%. If we resize the buffers very far in advance, say 2,400 microseconds before the circuit becomes active, TCP has a really long time to ramp up. But this actually achieves um, kind of a, a saturation point, where we have achieved 98% utilization, but we're just accumulating extra queuing, which is just going to hurt our latency. Similarly, if we wait to resize until just before the, the circuit becomes active, we're not going to ramp up enough to achieve high utilization. The right point for this particular experiment occurs at 1,800 microseconds, where we are at the, the uh, optimal point on the latency utilization trade-off space to achieve 90% utilization um, without additional excess pre-buffering. Looking directly at circuit utilization, um, as you would expect for various amounts of pre-buffering on the x-axis, we achieve steadily increasing circuit utilizations up until a maximum of 98 or 97%. Returning to latency from before, we were able to achieve very good uh, median latency, 
which is the, the orange line. But our tail latency is still problematic because we're still having large queues for a couple of milliseconds. Some packets are still getting stuck and are still getting long tail latencies. In this case, a two and a half, two uh, x increase for 90% circuit utilization. So how can we decrease the amount of pre-buffering that we're doing even further? Can we get the same utilization with less pre-buffering? And this brings in our second technique, RETCP. The idea here is that if we, uh, how can we manually, explicitly grow our congestion window even more aggressively? And we're going to do this by involving the sender TCP stack. We're going to communicate the state of the circuit network to the sender TCP. And the sender will react by multiplicatively increasing and decreasing its congestion window in advance of the circuit when the buffers are resized. This will produce a congestion window cartoon that looks something like this green line. Instead of a, a delicate ramp up, like with just dynamic buffers, we'll get a much more aggressive ramp up that will bring us to our, our ideal congestion window much faster. Uh, and instead of resizing quite far in advance, we'll be able to resize immediately before the circuit network goes active. Let's return to our visualization. But this time, instead of looking at data packets traveling from the center to the receiver, we're looking at ACK packets traveling back. RATCP is going to run at the sender, and it's going to look at the ACK packets that are coming back, and it's going to watch for marks. And these marks are going to be set by the hybrid network as packets traverse the network. So let's, this is an ACK. It originates at the receiver. It travels through the network. If the ACK goes over the packet switch, it's going to be marked with a zero. And we're going to reuse the existing ECN echo bit for this marking. And then this ACK will be communicated back to the sender. And the mark will be stored by RATCP. When the um, circuit scheduler notifies the top of rack switch queues that the, uh, there's a circuit incoming, the TOR buffers will increase, as described in the previous technique. And ACK will start being marked with a 1 instead. And these 1s will be communicated back to the sender, which will then look for a state transition from 0 to 1. And this transition means that the network is now in a state where it is expecting a circuit. And because the network is now expecting a circuit, TCP will ramp up much more aggressively. And I'll describe exactly how we do that ramp up on the sender side in the next slide. When the circuit is active, additional one marks won't trigger an additional ramp up. This is basically a state transition, not a repeated multiple multiplicative increase. When we switch back to the packet network, the marks will return to being zero. We do this multiplicative increase by a factor of alpha that we compute based on the relative, uh, the relationship between the circuit bandwidth delay product and the small capacity of the torque queues. Um, I can talk more about this offline. Um, we achieve uh, full utilization, but the important thing to note here is that we do it with an order of magnitude less pre-buffering. So instead of 1,800 microseconds, we only need 200 microseconds. Our median latency is similarly very good. But now, because we're using so much less pre-buffering, we achieve much better 99th percentile latency as well. For a cumulative improvement of 93% circuit utilization with only a 1.2x increase in tail latency. Um, I'll just mention briefly the limitations of this work. These are designed to be minimally invasive techniques. So there is more performance possible if you're willing to uh, engineer more control into your network. In summary, I have proposed two techniques for adapting TCP to rapid bandwidth fluctuations in a reconfigurable data center network. The first technique was dynamic buffer resizing, adapting top of rack switch queues to the network that's currently in use. And the second was a reconfigurable data center network TCP to ramp up aggressively to fill this new capacity. I didn't have much time to talk about the emulator that we're using, but it's available open source at this URL. And uh, please ask me any questions you may have. Uh, hi, Dave Oran, MIT Media Lab. Um, did you even think about comparing this to switching to a rate-based congestion control scheme, which would converge in one RTT? 
Um, we thought about a variety of different congestion control schemes, but we were looking at, we're trying to start from the basis of adapting the additive increase, multiplicative decrease, like congestion control algorithm that TCP usually runs. We could use more advanced techniques like rate-based congestion control, um, but we haven't uh, had the time to, to evaluate that yet. But I definitely agree. I mean, that it seems the cool. underlying problem is that you need many RTTs to ramp up. Yeah. So you can just directly address that problem by knowing the rate change mm -hmm. when, the, when the circuit comes up and, uh, and just switching and, 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 and knowing what your, what your rate should be. Um, I, I definitely agree that there are, if we take more explicit approaches like that, we can get higher performance. Um, nice talk. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I wonder if you see any packet reordering when you switch. Uh, the circuit switch and how do you, how do that affects the performance here? Uh, very interesting question. So, if um, you leave the packet network active while the reconfiguration is taking place, you definitely will see some reordering. And so, for our emulator, we disabled the packet network and the circuit network both during the reconfiguration. So we suppressed any reordering. But reordering is definitely an issue. And in this kind of uh, network, this research in general has to deal with reordering a lot. Thank the speaker.